So thank you everyone for coming to this webinar on seven steps to write your novel. And we will be also looking a bit at how to write your novel in a year. Um, that's something that I know is something very important to people. So we're going to be covering that. Now this evening I will be doing a presentation. So I will be disappearing in a minute and you'll see some slides and you'll hear my voice. And uh, please do uh, add anything in the chat as we go through. But uh, I'm going to be focusing on presenting the material and then we'll do the Q&A towards the end. So very excited about uh, this evening. So I will uh, put my slides up and we will get on with it. So welcome to this webinar on seven steps to write your novel. And I'm here, I mean, many of you are here because you're already on my email list, but I just wanted to kind of start by, uh, you know, where I am now is, uh, you know, I have, I think, 12 novels and they've just written number 13 and I've got nonfiction and, uh, you know, I'm, I make my living this way. But I wanted to take you back because the whole point of this webinar is to really go back to the beginning. And um, I started writing nonfiction in 2008 and then I started writing my first novel in 2009. And. And um, then the picture in the middle there is me in 2011 with my first book, Pentecost, uh, which I re-released as Stone of Fire a couple of years ago. And that is an, that's an interesting question in itself. Um, but basically, how you know what we'll be going through this evening is that process to get to that first novel and then i promise you if you haven't written that first novel yet getting that first one done is a very liberating experience and can unleash your creativity and then i have um i guess speeded up over the years to the point where i now have the tw 12 novels and 13th on the way so i'll be sharing today my lessons learned from that journey in the hope that it won't take you as long as it took me uh, to get this far Okay, so this is what we're going to go through. Uh, seven steps to write your novel. That's going to be the main bulk of the presentation. And then also a plan for writing a novel in a year. Then we're going to uh, look at if you need more help. And I'm going to give a bit of an introduction to my course on uh, and my community on writing a novel. And then we'll do the Q&A time. So please vote up the best questions. And I will give you the slide download link. So that is our plan. So without further ado, let's get straight in. like an iceberg. Um, and the reason I say this is because this is only an hour. <laughs> so obviously we are not going to make it through every single thing you need to be the most amazing novelist in the whole world. Um, but the great thing is you can write that first novel or, you know, if you're struggling, you can write a novel um, with a tiny, the tiny bit of knowledge above the water in the iceberg metaphor but there's always more to learn and of course this is the journey of a lifetime so uh, i fully expect to just give you a tiny little dip in the water today but i hope that if you get one or two things from this presentation that will be useful for you okay so step one understand what you're writing and why. And I st I'm starting with the mindset aspect of writing because it's surprising how many authors just jump into like scribbling things without considering what they're writing and why. So uh, one of the biggest things that people, sort of the biggest um, continuum, I think, is, you know, on, on the one hand, you have the prize, Pulitzer Prize winning literary fiction. Um, on the other hand, you have Fifty Shades of Grey. Um, and uh, I've put a quote there that um, is on there, terrible writing, but I can't put it down. Over 100 million copies sold of Fifty Shades of Grey. So it's a great example of a definition of success, which was pleasing readers and making money. <laughs> but one of the very important questions questions for you and if this is the question you haven't answered yet very important to answer it what is the definition of success for your book and and really be honest because um, some people will say oh well I just want to finish my book and then they're disappointed when it doesn't sell or some people might want critical acclaim and then uh, you know and not necessarily make any money and then they're not happy if they don't win a prize so I want you to try and think about like, why are you writing? Why do you want to write this book? Do you, why do you want to finish it? Is it a desire to tell a story, change someone's life, reach readers? And how is that defined? Is it, uh, you know, 5,000 people buy your book? Wow. Is it 50 people buy your book? I mean, that could be there. Uh, do you want to make significant income or any income? Do you want to get into a physical bookstore near your house <laughs> so that your friends can see it, which is completely fine too? Or do you want to have an agent or publisher 
validation for your work. And that is very important for many writers. And the decisions you make here, your definition of success, why you're writing, will impact what you write, how you publish, how you market, and how happy you are later. So it's super important that you think about this upfront. So that's thinking about you. And I think authors are actually pretty good at thinking about themselves. Um, so the first one is know thyself. And the second one is really thinking about your readers. And this is something that is actually very difficult and I completely understand how hard this is. But you have to start thinking about who is going to read your book. Where are they in the book ecosystem? What are their expectations of the genre? And the only way to do this, I've found, because when I first started, and, and I, I've got to say I got this wrong. Um, I started, when I started writing, I um, titled that first book Pentecost. Now, it is more like a Dan Brown book. And Stone of Fire, which it became, is a much better title for it because it's not a Christian book. And many people thought it was because of the title. I didn't think deeply enough about my potential readers. So I want you to consider what are the five to 10 best-selling or award-winning books that are similar to the story you want to write. And I would suggest the authors are alive. <laughs> uh, I met an author um, last night, actually, whose favorite author was Vladimir Nabokov. And I said, you know, to be fair, you can't actually emulate Nabokov <laughs> these days. You have to find a better role model. <laughs> so, um, but his goal was to win awards. So I said, brilliant, you know, go ahead. A traditional publishing might be best. So when you're thinking about these different things, you can absolutely write what you love and write what's on your heart. But if you want, if your definition of success involves making some income, you have to also write something that will find an audience. And that's why you can see some very good examples of genre here. Um, Nicholas Sparks is obviously romance. You know what you're going to get in that book. Although knowing Sparks, there might be some weeping as well. Uh, George R. R. Martin, a, a, sword, a sword there. Even if you didn't know Game of Thrones, you should know that that is um, fantasy or historical fiction. And then Stephen King, The Shining, very dark, um, you know, covers for horror slash thriller. So those are the, the some of the first few things that you've got to um, understand. And I'm just going to quickly check in the comments. Everyone, hopefully everyone can can still see. Yeah, it looks like nobody's complaining. So excellent. <laughs> we'll carry on. Um, OK, so. Let's go back to this. So the second thing, and yes, I am going fast uh, through these, but we do have quite a lot to get through in just the hour. So after you've decided what your definition of success is and why you are writing, you should have a few things written down uh, on your list there. The next thing is to fill your creative well. And this is very interesting because it's one of the things that is responsible for, and I say inverted commas, um, writer's block because Often writer's block, especially with a first novel, is about filling your creative well, so putting stuff in your head so your subconscious mind or your conscious mind can turn it into other things so you can then output it into a book. So if you do not put stuff in your head, how do you expect to put stuff out your head? <laughs> um, and many authors get worried about being original uh, at this point. And of course, there is no originality. Originality is actually taking things that exist in the world and combining them in new ways. So you're never going to be completely original. And that's fine <laughs> because readers often want something that's like this this type of thing, but a little bit different. So, you know, you should be reading tons of books. You should be, you know, watching great stuff on film and TV and going, oh, I really want to write something like that, but I wish it was like this. And then, uh, you know, that will help you fill your creative well. And this is something I learned as well over time and got some pictures here from my London Psychic uh, trilogy of tattoos and body modification. Now, I just want to point out that uh, <laughs> I'm, I'm what's known as a vanilla goth, <laughs> which is I love all this stuff, but I look like, you know, I haven't got tattoos, basically. <laughs> um, so but I love all this stuff. And what's interesting is when I started getting interested in body modification, tattoos, human anatomy, this type of thing, I was really worried. I was like. I, I don't think anyone else will find this interesting. But actually, what's fascinating is if you follow your curiosity, if you are honest about what fascinates you, you will attract people who are fascinated by the same stuff. So, and some really bad writing advice is don't, uh, sorry, is write what you know. And I'm saying to you, don't write what you know, 
write what you're interested in because that will help you fill the creative well and uh, start tuning in to what catches your eye. So for example, today uh, we were at, in London at the uh, British Library and we went to the um, map exhibition because there's a map shop near where I live in Bath and I've been walking past it and walking past it uh, and I'm like, I really want to do something with maps. I love this cartography stuff. Oh, and I, I just see a typo on there. <laughs> I actually don't think it's a typo. I think the picture was put on top. So, uh, you know, I know what you guys are like. You love finding typos. <laughs> Uh, but anyway, so notice your own interest and we, we went to this uh, map show and I took my notebook and we were wandering around and I just wrote down the things that attracted me, the things that made me interested, um, like uh, redrawing the line on a map like they did, you know, after the First World War, um, you know, had huge consequences. So I'm following my curiosity in this direction and I want you to get used to doing that too because that is where the gold is. That is going to help you keep creating for the long term. And then write down the sparks that appear. And just little notes that I thought as I was looking at this, or the colours that stood out, or the, you know the fact that you can turn a 3D world into a flat document. Um, you know, just really interesting things. So I use, um, I have Moleskin and Luke Term notebooks, and I know there was a little bit of a discussion over notebooks in the uh, chat earlier. Uh, so I have that physical writing, which I normally do when I'm in this sort of idea generation phase, and then I use Things app on my phone but other people use Evernote other things that will sync across devices because often we're out uh, and about I also take pictures put them in um, Pinterest or Twitter or wherever when I can find them later and also I use Scrivener and uh, Scrivener is a fantastic writing tool I, I will be coming back to it later but keeping an ideas list uh, on Scrivener is a really good idea um, but as I said I, I think as long as you write it down it doesn't matter what it is do not obsess <laughs> do not obsess about the tool it's more about your process and noticing these sparks um, I also feel and I've got this written on my wall uh, trust emergence because you know, I, I actually have a lot of notebooks. There's a few of them on the screen there. And I don't sit down and reread all my notebooks every time I want to write something new. I trust emergence. I trust that things that went into my head years ago will come out at another point. And when I was going through my notebooks, when I was writing The Successful Author Mindset uh, earlier this year, I found this uh, in one of my notebooks. So that's my handwriting there on the right. Um, you probably can't read it, so I've typed it there. Uh, the broken pieces taken by the early church when Christ was resurrected, the slab he laid on was broken into pieces, searched for by many and held now by the legacy of those who persecuted. And that little piece I wrote that in 2004 and the these pieces of rock um, sort of that get found by big evil and uh, very exciting books Stone of Fire um, actually uh, had had arrived years and years before and had you know actually resurrected themselves uh, later on um, in my head when I started writing in 2009 now I had not I didn't think that I'd had that idea before, but clearly it had been rattling around in my brain for years. So I want you to trust emergence, but make sure you write down the things um, that you find, uh, you know, the things that you notice. And this is a bit like training. I know that some of you will feel that you don't have any ideas. And I literally think that that phase of writing a novel is because you haven't got used to listening to your ideas you haven't noticed your ideas so start trusting um, those uh, those feelings start trusting why your eyes go to a particular thing when you walk into a room or when you walk into a bookshop what do you notice uh, when you go to an art gallery what do you notice do you even go to an art gallery <laughs> um, you know if you go to the skate park what do you notice so just start getting used to that Okay, I'm just gonna check the comments again. Are we are we doing good? Just say yes. It's all good in the uh, in the comments, so I can see. Uh, yes, fantastic, excellent, uh, brilliant. Trust emergence. Thanks, Dean. Glad you like that. Okay.
cool, I will carry on. <laughs> but I know that this is not a non-fiction book about how maps work. <laughs> so I have to think about writing a story, not just a pile of words. And my research and my notes, they're just a pile of words. Um, and what's interesting is that a professional editor I interviewed on the podcast, um, uh, Harry DeWolf, he said that the biggest problem he finds with manuscripts from first time authors is they give me a load of typing instead of a story. And this might literally be 100,000 words of typing, <laughs> not a story. Um, and uh, the prize-winning literary fiction writer Flannery O'Connor said, most people know what a story is until they sit down to write one. And I wanted to put that here because again, when you're, when you're starting out writing fiction, you think because you read thousands of books that it will just be you know, it will just happen, <laughs> that you'll just naturally be able to, you know, put it all out there. But actually, it is difficult to write a story. It's not something that you naturally do. You actually have to learn a few things. Um, and when you learn these things, it becomes a lot easier. So start thinking about what do you love about your favorite books as a reader? And I'm using The Hunger Games as an example because many people will have seen the films even if they haven't read the book. And I think The Hunger Games is a perfect example of a story. Um, uh, you know, and a story as in, you know, there's a character, something happens, there's an arc, you, there is, you know, it wraps up at the end. You feel satisfied when you uh, go through The Hunger Games as a book or a film. So these are the questions to start thinking about, you know, when you consider your most favorite books, um, preferably ones that are similar to a book you want to write. So The Hunger Games is a kind of, it's YA, but it's actually a thriller. Um, it, you know, yeah, it's pretty much a thriller. So how do the books begin and end? Um, and here, of course, we've got, uh, you know, Katniss would have been fine carrying on shooting rabbits in the woods with Gail until Prim is chosen for the reaping. And then the story begins. That's the inciting incident. And what is it about the character or the plot or the setting that keeps you reading? And that's really important, too. Like, what is it? What do you love about these characters? And of course, Katniss, you know, is, is wants to save her sister and then she wants to save her district. And, then you know, it's kind of like, saving the world she's a, she's a hero um, even though she's uh, you know not perfect and that's important too um, what is it about the plot the setting why do you want to turn the pages what keeps you interested and that doesn't need to be um, you know explosions or anything it can be character development so you know depends on the type of genre is the book a series do you want to read more of that character and this is really good for later on and why do you crave these types of books? What, what emotional resonance does this book give you? Then it's about getting to grips with story structure. And of course, this is a massive topic. So I'm just giving you the, um, the, the, the real basics. Um, and you would have seen this, I'm sure. Uh, one of the hallmarks of new writers or people writing fiction for the first time is how many books you have on writing. <laughs> so I dare say you've all actually seen um, this type of story structure before. But it, I, I found that it didn't make sense to me for a long time. And so really trying to keep it s simple. Um, but you know, you can see the ordinary world, Katniss is there shooting rabbits, um, the inciting incident, Prim is picked for the reaping, Katniss uh, goes instead of her and now we know what the story is we know that the climax has to be does Katniss survive the Hunger Games and then how does she return to the real world so that's how it's going to work and this and some people have been um, have questioned how do I know when my story's finished and this is it's partly to do with story structure. So if the inciting incident is, um, yeah, uh, Prim is chosen for the reaping, Katniss goes instead, what is the inevitable conclusion? She has to tackle the Hunger Games, the rising obstacles, and then there will have to be a big climax. Will she make it through? So does she achieve the goal of what she wants to? Um, what's stopping her? Who's stopping her? Will she make it through? That's basically the idea of structure is helping you design a better story that satisfies the reader because, you know, there are these human elements that we all resonate with. And when a story works, it really works. Um, you know, going back to uh, Fifty Shades of Grey, you know, 
she's a good storyteller, <laughs> even if she's not a great writer. Um, so structure and boundaries help you become more creative. And that's really important because I know a lot of people resist some of this structure, but don't resist it. Let it help you. moody and uh, well she kills people <laughs> um, but people what you want to, as a reader you want to spend more time with her so um, probably my biggest recommendation at the beginning with your book is to write one protagonist so one main character and again the Hunger Games is a good example because what who is who are the books about they're about Katniss now there are other characters I'm not saying there is only one character in your book but the whole point of the story is the journey of one person and then there are these other uh, characters who were around them the friends and the mentors and you know that other archetypes um, but basically if you try and write something like Game of Thrones <laughs> uh, you are going to get yourself in trouble. Um, the only reason George R. R. Martin can write Game of Thrones, and in fact, he gets a bit lost around book four, in my opinion, <laughs> um, is that he has been writing for a long, long time. So make it easy on yourself. With that first book, pick one character and follow the story through their eyes. Use you can use multiple points of view, but just have one main character. And then think about these questions. So what does your character want? and why. So um, Katniss wants to stop Prim being taken for the Hunger Games because she knows that her sister will get killed. Then once she's chosen, once she goes, she wants to survive the games and win the games. And why? Because otherwise she's dead. So there's pretty high stakes there. So you can do that with whichever of the books you're choosing as an example. Think about what does that character want and why? What is their goal? And then what or who is trying to stop them? And these are the antagonist um, characters or forces in the world. Uh, and again, with, with Katniss, it will be the other tributes who are in the Hunger Games, but it's also the Hunger Games itself and all the different obstacles um, they have to follow. Uh, I'm not a massive Harry Potter fan, but again, you could follow this through for Harry Potter. Um, even though there are friends, there's very clearly it's the story of Harry and his um, journey uh, along the way and the people who try to stop him. How do they overcome the obstacles along the way? And uh, these are all things that will come on to plot in a minute, but um, these questions will help you formulate a better story. So, um, for example, the, the map thing that I'm thinking about, I, you know, there's, I've got a character and, you know, she, she will, there will be maps involved. But basically, in terms of overcoming a first obstacle, she doesn't even know how to read these particular types of maps. So she will have to learn. And that is an interesting thing they also do in The Hunger games uh, you know Katniss can use the bow and arrow but she also has to learn some of the other things that go on in the in the games she also has to work with other people she also has to you know commit some violent acts along the way so all the type of human things that uh, we do we create alliances we we have uh, conflict uh, you know we have family and friends and all those different aspects of of human life basically and then how is your character changed as a result of the journey what is different in their life by the end um, and of course at the end of book one of hunger games um katniss goes back and but then we know she becomes a symbol for the resistance uh, so her life is very changed so go back to the books you love the most and you'll find that these are core aspects Okay, so let's talk about plot. I know we're going super fast, but my aim tonight is to really give you that tip of the iceberg and a whole load of questions for you to go away and think about, uh, about your own book.
that are more plot driven books um, but actually my London Psychic uh, trilogy uh, is very character driven and um, my, arc my later arcane books are much more character driven in fact this one I've just finished yesterday end of days is very character driven so think about what does your character want and why now obviously so um, Katniss wants to survive the Hunger Games so how do we have plot around that well how do we try and stop them achieving what they want? So as soon as you've asked, answered that question, what does my character want? You can then throw stuff at them. So try and stop them getting what they want. And who is stopping them get what they want? And how do they overcome the things that are thrown at them? And how do they change each time? So, you know, Katniss is this super independent person, but in order to overcome some of the obstacles, she has to make alliances, first of all, with the younger girl and then with Peter. And she, ha she has to learn these new ways of being, which means she inevitably has character development. So I want you to think about plot um, in that way. And if you have ideas for plot that are not related to character, then that's fine too. I have some examples here. Um, setting. So I'm someone who loves setting. <laughs> um, I get a lot of ideas from setting. And um, this example here, the Taj Mahal, uh, Destroyer of Worlds. So basically, I, went, I wanted to write a book about um, this particular figure, the Shiva Nataraja, who destroys the world. I want it set in India. I need to use the Taj Mahal. <laughs> so basically, I knew I wanted to use setting. And I, before I even thought about character, I thought about how I could use the setting in the plot and then put my characters in the setting. Um, and it turns out there's a whole lot of conspiracy theories around the Taj Mahal. So as soon as you start researching, you find these really cool things that you can put into your book. Because setting is the other really important thing about plot. You can't just have characters talking to each other in an empty white room. And this is another um, classic mistake of early writers. Uh, you know, they'll just have some dialogue and it's like, yeah, but where are they? <laughs> you need sensory detail. What does it smell like? What are the sounds? What can you see? What colors are there? Who else is there? Uh, you know, that type of thing needs to go on. There needs to be action. There needs to be plot in a setting, in somewhere specific. Now, the other example I've got here, um, if those of you who don't recognize it, is in Game of Thrones, this is the, the wall, um, which uh, if you don't know, is a, a big wall at the top of um, the territory and uh, keeps out the, kept out the wildlings and now keeps out the really bad snow people. Um, and uh, very interesting setting because you've got the defense of the realm by the wall. You've got the Knights of the Watch who basically have gone there to serve and to keep um, the bad guys out. And they've this, this brilliant kind of snowy freezing landscape which brings so much conflict to this the scenes that are written at that location. So I really think that setting can be very important and um, certainly it is for me. So I hope that will give you some ideas um, around plot. Okay, just going to check back in with you all again on the comments. Uh, how are we doing? Just say whether you are good in the comments. I, I'm very good at visuals because I'm a visual writer um, and setting is particularly visual. But what does that, what does the Taj Mahal smell like? Um, what does it, what, what is it, you know, and I've put there, it's, there's a lot of tourist shops cooking outside. You know, what does the wall smell like? What does snow smell like? These are all good things for writing. Um, to think about getting the words on the page for your first draft. And one of the things that I think um, people often uh, struggle with is that the first draft 
of anything is not very good. And this is a quote, so I think I can say, the first draft of anything is shit, and that's by Ernest Hemingway. Um, so I think one of the problems with new writers is that they consider that you need to start with sentence one in chapter one of the book one. And they get so worried about that perfect sentence that never happens. Um, I can tell you that the first chapter, or the pro I often use a prologue, you know, that initial idea it's often never the thing you write first. In fact, you polish that introductory uh, first chapter more times than anything else. So I certainly wouldn't write it first uh, unless you had that idea. Um, but even then, whatever idea you have, just relax and get black on white, um, which is get words on a page. If you have words on a page, you can edit that into something else. And that's so important to, uh, you know, be able to edit it into uh, a better book. And we'll come on to editing in a minute. But the point here is to just get the words down. And I realize that this is difficult for people. I actually find the first draft is the hardest as well. So um, I certainly, uh, if you are someone who struggles with that first draft, I get it. <laughs> but what you have to do is, again, I think come back to trust emergence. Uh, if you actually get to the page, something will happen. So let's talk about um, that, uh, specific ways to get that first draft done. So these are some of the things that have made a big difference to me. So the first one is schedule your writing time as you would any other appointment. And these are the things that kind of changed me from being someone who wanted to write to someone who does write and does put out books on a regular basis. Um, so first of all, I, you know, I actually mean schedule it, whether you use an app on your phone, whether you use a wall calendar, whether you use some kind of um, diary or whatever you do, um, schedule your writing time. So as you, many people, parents, for example, are very good at scheduling their children's um, events, but not their own. <laughs> or maybe you schedule your time at the gym, but not your writing time. So really important, get that down. And this is what I've just been doing for the first quarter of 2017, is I've been scheduling the writing periods in my um, uh, I'm now, <laughs> those of you who've been around a while uh, with me know that I've been using a Filofax for years. <laughs> I've actually just moved onto a calendar app on, on my phone, which is kind of scary, but I've been filling up writing times in my schedule for the next few months so that I won't have any excuse and I won't fill up that time with something else. Now that may be before work, um, if you have a day job uh, or, you know, before the kids get up or whatever. When I had a day job um, back in the day, uh, I would get up at 5am and write for an hour before going to work because when I got home, I was just too tired. So you have to find uh, what that will be in terms of when is the best time for you, but uh, certainly uh, you schedule it whenever that is. The next thing is to then time that writing period. So let's say you get up at 5.30 and you do, you're gonna do 45 minutes because then you know you need to have breakfast and go out to work or whatever. So 45 minutes, you are not allowed to do anything else. <laughs> you actually have to write. And if you just sit there and write, this is terrible, this is terrible, that's fine because actually you'll get bored pretty quickly and you'll start writing something. Um, and the other thing is with this is just allow the feelings of discomfort to happen and let them come and let them go. And uh, no one said this was easy. And it's it's not easy. Well, it's simple, but it's not easy. I think that's it. that's the way of putting it. You just need to start writing. Just write whatever. And they don't need to be perfect sentences. Don't use spell checker. Don't start editing. Don't start with chapter one. <laughs> just start writing. So I haven't started writing this map book yet. Uh, I let things pile up to the point where I really need to write. Um, but, and if you're in that phase, then still schedule that writing time because writing is not just the first draft, it's also the thinking. So you can use that time for thinking about character or plot, but when, we, when you're actually in the writing period, um, the first draft phase, then you want to start writing these actual chapters. And the best thing I find is I normally just start with the name of the character. So I'll say, Morgan Sierra walked into the room. Really 
simple sentence. So then if you've never met Morgan Sierra before, uh, and if I've never written about her, obviously I have, but then I'm like, so what does Morgan Sierra look like? What does the room look like? Why did she walk into the room? What is in the room? <laughs> you can start asking questions about a simple sentence and then you can start writing those down. And I promise you that is the only way to start. So if you do nothing else, if you're struggling with getting your first draft done, then schedule that time um, and time your writing. Seriously, that's it. Get black on white. And um, that's pretty much the most important thing. Okay, so uh, writing is rewriting. So we're now going to assume that you have some chapters. Um, one of the reasons I wanted to bring up story structure before is that in this editing phase, um, that story structure can be very helpful. For example, if how I edit is I print out my entire manuscript when I finished, you know, when I get to a point where I've gone, okay, the, whatever happened in the beginning to make my character walk into that room, now we know. <laughs> and it's ended. The story is ended. Um, then I print it out and I start to look at it. And at the beginning, you will definitely find there are problems with your structure. For example, does your character actually resolve that open question of whether they um, were going to attain their goal or not? Are there obstacles in the way or is it just Morgan walked into the room, picked up the trophy and won the Hunger Games? You know, no, <laughs> that's not a story. <laughs> Um, so you have to think about this. So the first thing in the um, editing phase is really looking at that structure. But I wanted you to um, also think about editing as an investment in becoming a better writer. Because in my opinion, and certainly since I started writing in 2009, the very, that I have improved and I can say I've improved because, you know, my my sales have gone up, my books get better reviews and, you know, I, I have become a better, in inverted commas, writer than I was by practice and also through paying for edits. And of course, I have a list uh, if you need an edit at thecreativepen.com forward slash editors. But these are the types of edit that I want you to consider. So the first one is the self-edit. As I said, I print out the whole thing and I will uh, scribble on my manuscript by hand. And often these are the big structural movements. It's like, oh, I need another scene here. Um, I often will write a couple of scenes by in one character's point of view and then I will intersperse it later. So there'll be a Morgan chapter and then there'll be a baddie chapter and then there's a Morgan chapter and a baddie chapter because each time you can have a, a cliffhanger that will take them over into the next um, chapter. It's like the the reader goes, oh, I want to know what happens next. And then you, you take them somewhere else. Um, so in that self edit, I will often move chapters around and Scrivener again, and I didn't come back to that, but Scrivener uh, software is fantastic. And well, it, the, one of the reasons it's fantastic is because you can drag and drop the chapters. So you don't have to write in order. And that was probably the biggest change for me between book one and book two is I moved on to Scrivener. I did that first book in Word and it was a nightmare. And then I moved into Scrivener and my life became a whole lot easier. Uh, so then I also do line edits at that stage. You know, um, for example, in this last book, I used the word huge uh, about 150 times. <laughs> And often you only notice that later, you know, I might have been sitting there going, oh, I need another word, but I'll just write huge because I'm in my first draft um, or everything was green. Like literally everything was green everywhere. It was like the Wizard of Oz. <laughs> so I had to go through and like change color schemes, uh, you know, things like everyone's eyes were green. You can't have every character in a book have green eyes. That just doesn't work. So these are the things you pick up when you self edit. Uh, and I then will get my self-edit to a point where I can't see any more issues or I'm so sick of it, I need someone else to uh, feedback. And then um, with my uh, a number of books, I've had structural or story edits and I still get these for my books because I find these the most useful things in terms of my own improvement. So uh, that structural or story edit will often just be a report. It will be, you know, maybe a couple of pages or 10 pages on what you can do to improve your story. And at the beginning with that first novel, or if you're still in your early phases, that can be really good. Then there's the line edit or the copy edit, which is that classic red pen line by line rewrite thing. 
and that can be very stressful for a new author. I remember getting it for my first novel and being kind of devastated. <laughs> but what you have to remember is that the whole point of an editor is to make your writing better. And that's what you're paying for. And um, I would say that uh, editors are like, you know, a bit like dating. You don't necessarily find your perfect editor on that first edit, but over time you will find people. And I've used a lot of different editors. I just consider it part of the investment in becoming a better writer. And then just before you publish, if you self-publish, then um, I always get a separate proofread from a separate person and that is the final typos and grammar because you've done all these other rewrites you need to make sure they're fixed up before you publish if you have a publishing deal um, I do suggest you go all the way through to copy edit because even though they will give you another edit um, these days traditional publishers will only pick up good manuscripts that have been through this type of process already Um, if you're ready to start now or if you're somewhere in the middle of this process, here are some of my thoughts for getting the book done in a year. Now, I know some of you listening will be thinking, well, uh, you know, I wanted, I've heard indie authors talk about writing a book in a month or in a week or whatever. <laughs> and I would say to you, uh, many of those people have been writing books for years um, or they are not necessarily, you know, they're, they're I'm not going to comment any further than that, but often people who are writing that fast um, understand story structure and uh, have some kind of process to follow. If this is, if you're at the beginning of your journey, this is more like the timeline you will be looking at. And in fact, for me, that first novel took 15 months uh, from sort of that first NaNoWriMo in November 2009 to getting the book out in April 2011. So by making it to a year, I'm assuming you've done a bit of work already. <laughs> so here's how I would um, split it up. So first of all, for, I would say that the idea phase, and I've overlapped it with the first draft because this is what happens to me. I start getting ideas. So this map thing, and <laughs> I mean, I keep saying map thing and you'll be th thinking that I don't have a clue. I don't really have a clue right now. For me, it literally is this big idea. But tomorrow morning in my writing session, I'm going to start thinking about who the main character is and what does she want. And as soon as I get that, I will then start to um, have some more ideas. And at some point you need to stop doing research and coming up with ideas and start writing that first draft. And that's why I've overlapped it there because as soon as you have enough ideas to get started with the writing, as soon as you have a character um, and a character who, you know, and you know what that character wants, you'll start getting some ideas about what will stop them. You know where it's gonna be set, um, you, know, you know the genre, then I would suggest you do start writing. And I've given you seven to nine months to write that first draft with the assumption that you are not a full-time author <laughs> and you are fitting this in around the rest of your life. Um, now that might seem a long time, but it will go really fast. Um, so I, I'm going to give you some uh, how that will break down in a minute. But basically, no excuses, finish the draft. And I know many of you uh, on the call will have notes. Maybe you even have a first draft um, or maybe you just can't get that done. Well, this is the no excuses point. And if you're at... Um, if you're going through this process, actually set dates. So here, you're, we're saying that you'll, you will finish that first draft by the end of September 2017. Uh, and that's quite a big deal. <laughs> so that might be a challenge, but you have to set yourself these goals. And if you don't set a goal, it's unlikely you will hit that goal because you won't have one. <laughs> so I had said that I would publish my book uh, by my birthday in 2011, which was in March, and I made it in April. And if I hadn't, obviously I failed in inverted commas, but actually that was um, a success because it started me on the journey. Now, once you've got that first draft, you still need to do the self-editing. And I've put that at the end and there's no overlap because that has to happen uh, after you've finished your first draft. Do not try and edit your book 
before you've finished that draft. Seriously, that will hold you up because you will realize that it's not so great <laughs> and you'll start editing and you'll edit that paragraph again and again and it will be very difficult. So my recommendation, especially for that first novel, until you kind of get hold of your own process is to um, you know spend that time self-editing separately and then after that that's the year you will have finished a manuscript and then you'll be looking for an editor and going through whichever publishing process you want but that is how I would do a book in a year now just to break that down even further uh, to get that draft written you have to look at how many words you're aiming for and this it, it, it will depend. <laughs> I mean, you could just aim for a novella, which is a short novel. So uh, if you've read My Day of the Vikings or um, One Day in Budapest, they're novellas and they're around 27,000 words. Now that's great. It's much easier to write a novella versus um, a romance novels are around 50,000. Epic fantasy can be sort of 130,000 words uh, or even more. Um, and my thrillers are normally around 60 to 80,000. And that's a kind of James Patterson length thriller, which is fine for my genre. So have an idea of how many words you're aiming for. And then I've broken it down here. So we're going to say 70,000 words, seven months, and I'm saying three sessions a week. So that gives us 84 writing sessions in total over seven months, which means you only have to do 833 words per session to complete that first draft. And if you use Scrivener, you can set all these goals and targets and it will calculate how many you've got left and whether you're on track. And that really, really helps. Um, so you can do around 833 words in an hour or an hour and a half if you're you know, a little bit slower. Um, you know, at where I am now after um, 13 novels is I do kind of 2000 words an hour but you know I'm just saying if you can give it an hour you should be able to manage 833 words uh, and if you do that you will have written a draft which is pretty exciting so the main thing there is that's three sessions a week three hours a week can you commit three hours a week for actually writing and that is the big question. That is what is going to make a difference for you. And if you can't commit three hours a week, then why not? And what is stopping you? And this is the big question because you need to be honest about this. What is stopping you? Is it your mindset? Is it that you literally, you know, can't give anything else up? Maybe you have to give up something, another hobby. Maybe you have to stop going out in the evenings or stop watching TV. Um, what are you willing to give up to achieve your goal of writing a novel? And uh, how much do you want this? I hope that many of you really do want this and that you're ready to commit to that three hours a week um, and answer that question, what's stopping you? <laughs> because that's my challenge and, and that's what I wanted to go through with you this evening is how you can actually write your novel. So, are you ready? We also now have um, the members only Facebook group, uh, which where I answer questions. I'm in there every day. And also we share resources, lessons learned. You can network with other authors who are going through the journey 
um, at the same time as you are, so you know you're not alone. And uh, really great. And I, I wasn't going to do it, but so many people wanted a Facebook group, so we have one now, and uh, I can answer questions in a lot more detail when um, they're in that kind of forum. There's also bonus interviews uh, with various industry experts, including things like writer's block and story structure. And there are video lessons, audio downloads, slides in PDF and lots of extra materials. And you can watch on any device and uh, you can download it too. So you don't have streaming errors. <laughs> and of course it's self-paced so you can go through it quickly or take it slow and you get lifetime access and everything I update over time. And If you go to thecreativepen.com forward slash write novel and use the code DEC16, so like December, DEC16, you'll get $50 off the full price um, for the next week. And you can do the single payment or six months uh, at $50 a week. And if you use that uh, six month one, you actually get the first month for free. And uh, we use the secure Teachable platform to process payment and deliver the course. So uh, just in case you haven't used Teachable, you have to create a logon when you go to that payment screen and then uh, you will redeem the coupon and the coupon there, DEC16, and click the redeem coupon again, and that will take the uh, $50 off. And if you do the $50 a month, you'll get that first installment for free. So uh, that's how the payment will work. And yeah, it is uh, just $297 for lifetime access. see how it goes okay so we are now going to move into the q a <laughs> as in uh, lots of people write books. Um, so uh, yeah, but in terms of the process that has been refined and honed, I did actually want to mention that at thecreativepen.com forward slash write novel, I have all the posts from when I actually wrote that first novel and, it, and there are videos there which are hilarious when I, I realize things like what point of view means. So the biggest difference between writing a first novel and a second novel is that literally when you write that first novel, you don't know what you don't know. Like you think you understand point of view until you try and write a chapter in a point of view and you realize that you're head hopping or you're getting it wrong or all this different type of stuff that you didn't even know before. Or things like setting, um, you know, we mentioned very briefly about um, uh, sensory detail. That's something that uh, is very important and I've, only really got into that in subsequent books. My also the understanding of the roller coaster of the writing journey. So I understand now what writing a novel feels like, the emotional highs and lows, the feeling of, oh, I am just the worst writer in the whole world, or I will never solve this problem in my writing, or um, you know, just the, the in fact, you know, I'll say it, and if you've read The Author Mindset, it's in there, but I cancelled my launch drinks for that first novel because I was just so devastated and so worried about putting my words out into the world, about people reading my mind. And uh, so it was really uh, very hard to bear your soul to the world. But what I would also say is that it is one of the most important things. And I actually think that first 
novel can change your own life and can really help release a lot of creative blocks in a way because once you've got rid of that first book once that's come out of you onto the page you'll get so many more ideas so probably the the, the difference is understanding things like story structure understanding the elements of the novel that you have to learn with that first book and then improve over time and also understanding the emotional journey is completely normal and um, the self-doubt and all those aspects um, that go along with it you would also find it useful so the next question uh, do you write multiple books a year at, and at the same time how do you juggle several projects and not get confused do you plan or pants or do a mixture if you plan what is your process what is a realistic writing publishing schedule okay so basically I think Kaylee you have been listening to the um, uh, people out there who are sort of writing tons and tons of books. So basically this year, I'm, I do this full time, right? I don't write fiction all the time, but I, I don't have another job. This is, this is my job. Um, I've written, I wrote one novel in January, February, March, so Destroyer of Worlds. I wrote a nonfiction book over the summer and I, then I wrote End of Days um, towards the end of the year. So I have done three books this year, two novels and a nonfiction, but I do this full time. What I hope that also shows is that I don't do more than one at the same time. So I, I write my first draft. Um, so when I did End of Days, I did that September, I think. So I just, for that whole month, every day I booked three hours in a, um, uh, I would go to cafes or I also went to a co-working space and um, basically went in there for three hours and I did my writing. So I don't get confused because I focus on finishing that specific project, that specific draft of the specific project. Really important. So, and then the other thing to remember while you're doing that is you will get loads of other ideas. So this map thing is a great example. I st this map shop, we've been living near this map shop for a year. And every time I walk, walk past it, I've been like, oh, I'm really interested in that. But I won't go in because if I go into that map shop, I will confuse my brain and I will start thinking about map stories. So I made myself not go in there. And the very day I finished the draft of End of Days, I went in the map shop. So I didn't allow myself to get caught up in ideas for a new um, uh, book um, before I'd finished that one. Okay, so I hope that helps. And, and the point is, if you're writing your first novel, just try and park all your other ideas. So as I said, keep a notebook, keep your apps, um, whatever the app is that you use. I use Things app. Um, and essentially just any idea that comes to you that doesn't fit into that book, just write it down and that will tell your brain that uh, you will come back to it later. And as I said, trust emergence. If that idea is a good idea, it will uh, come back later. Um, and that will get you to write your novel and you agree with yourself that while you're in that particular cafe having that particular drink you won't do anything but write I suspect that that will be the best investment in your writing possible after editing of course <laughs> um, okay so my app is things as in uh, th I N G S. And that is indeed the next question. Um, are there any apps or programs that you suggest for helping you stay organized to make your writing goals for 2017? So first of all is, um, I, as I said, I use things app to note my, uh, ideas down. I, uh, use Scrivener, um, Scrivener S C R I V. -E. Someone put it in the notes, <laughs> um, Scrivener for, um, keeping all my research together in terms of, um, you know, each book has its own Scrivener project and I keep all my notes in there and I write in there and only once that has been fully edited do I export it and uh, start working, you know, start doing the publishing side. But basically uh, that is super important to organize yourself. But the 
other important thing is not to over engineer yourself. So I mentioned some people have said Evernote um, and if you can use Evernote and you've got that sorted as part of your process, awesome because it is a very good tool. Um, but personally, I've tried it and it just overcomplicated my brain. So I'm just preferring to use um, Scrivener and Things app and my own notebooks. The other thing, probably the most important thing is your calendar or your diary or your calendar app on your phone or whatever you use to schedule your time. That would probably be my number one recommendation. If you do nothing else this evening, please schedule your next writing time um, when you will actually work on your book. I think that's it's just super, super important. It's really great, Di, and first of all, I write a lot of multicultural characters because my own family is multicultural and I want my um, nieces and um, future nephews uh, to see their own life in my characters. And I also think, and because I write all over the world, like a Destroyer of Worlds has a lot of Indian characters in, um, it's important to research it by, I would say, reading books that are written by people of that racial um, uh, background or culture. Um, the other thing is that people are people. <laughs> and, uh, you know, I, 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 you know, if I have a secret agent who happens to be African-American, which I do in one day in New York, um, Naomi, my agent is half African-American, half Native American. Now, I don't necessarily, I, I don't have either of those backgrounds, but she's a female uh, secret agent in New York. She's pretty much, you know, has a lot in common with other people who've been in that situation. I, and I write about murders that I have never committed. <laughs> I write about things that are magic that never happened. So I want you to think about it on this kind of sliding scale. One, really great of you to even be thinking that you want to do this. And um, definitely reading books um, by people of that group is great. But secondly, you're writing a novel. <laughs> so, uh, you know, avoid stereotypes. Um, um, but give it all you've got, you know, imagine, and people are people, they love, they love their, their, their partners, they love their children, uh, you know, they fight, you know, whatever, just avoid caricatures um, that you assume are true. The other thing I found is to have beta readers. So when I wrote Risen Gods with Jay Thorne, um, I essentially, um, we wrote it about, um, and there are a couple of Maori New Zealander characters, and I asked on my podcast, is anybody out there <laughs> a New Zealand Maori, and uh, can you please read the book, like be a beta reader and comment, and indeed I did have um, a guy read it and he said, no, it's fine, you haven't offended anyone in a cultural manner, and I had had um, an Indian lady read it uh, for Destroyer of Worlds. So I really just try and make sure that I have somebody read it in a, a sort of beta reader point of view. But at the end of the day, we write uh, fiction. So give it a go. But really great that you asked that. I, I appreciate it a lot. I know some people don't, but there you go. Um, okay, so Julie says, do you have any tips for deciding on the right point to end a novel? Okay, well, I really hope that I answered this earlier, but I'll just remind you um, when I basically said uh, about the inciting incident. So you have a character and the character wants something. They, they have a goal and then the end point of the story, well, the climax of the story is, do they achieve that goal or do they fail to achieve that goal? And that might be, you know, in a romance novel, it opens and the, the woman or the man or, you know, whatever is lonely and, and they're going through problems and they want a romance. The ultimate thing is, will they achieve that romance or not? Will they achieve happiness? Um, you know, the Hunger Games, it was, it's obvious from the point that Katniss steps in to save Prim, the question is, will she survive the Hunger Games or not? Once we've got to that climax of, yes, they make it 
to the point where she has survived the Hunger Games, then there is the denouement or the end, um, that kind of after the climax when you um, go back to the real world as such. So the right point to end a novel is the point at which you have answered the question of the inciting incident. I hope that makes sense. Um, yeah, so uh, someone just asked there about, do you have a syllabus for the course? If you go to the creativepen.com forward slash write novel, you'll, you'll get the list of things that's in there or download the slides um, and you will see the, the syllabus in the course there. interest of a guy who she likes what advice would you give to raise the stakes and losing the love of the guy she's interested in this is massive stakes uh, especially if you're writing YA for example um, it would be very interesting to see um, how old your character is but also this this is the basis for the whole romance genre if you know if if the love interest of the person who we set our hearts on is not high stakes i don't know what is <laughs> so i think that you haven't realized that you know the stakes are not just the world is going to blow up and i write thrillers where the world's going to blow up and you know the world's going to end end of days is kind of over the top so i have over the top stakes but that's my genre you have to look at your genre so it sounds like this has love interest it might be romance so yeah this is the stakes <laughs> lover love is very high stakes i hope that helps um, but basically you have to put stuff in the way, you know, and think about other people. So some other woman tries to steal him, think about a situation, they're thrown together in some, you know, situation at work or, you know, just start thinking about, okay, what is going to get in the way of their love and, uh, how will it, how will it end? If it's a romance, they have to get together, but you have to make it really, really hard. So I think probably you need to put more difficulty into their relationship. It's not just girl meets boy and then, um, happy ever after. Um, so how do you pick one to focus on? Well, first of all, just try and get down all the ideas. So like I've said, use an, use an app or use a, a document or something. Get every night, just download from your brain. <laughs> and then some of it will not be big enough for a story. So for example, this map idea, that isn't a story. Uh, so in order to focus down on something, you have to decide what is gonna keep my interest for the next year? What am I excited about reading? What can I not stop looking at? You know, what, what, what do I really want to um, focus on? And then structure the story around that. And it may be that many of those ideas can come together in one story. Uh, so for, you know, for example, I, want, I always do stuff with magic and demons in, in some way, supernatural stuff. And, uh, you know, that will come into my map world in some way. But you pick the story that you're fascinated with and you can't do enough of um, and make sure you write down that other stuff. But just, you know, say, say to your brain, thanks, brain, for that idea. But I'm just going to focus on this one for now. And um, yeah, you have to finish what you write. You have to finish a story. But it may be that story is a short story. So 5,000 words or something. It doesn't have to be a whole novel. process until you have a process until you've actually had a go at writing that book and 
our processes change over time. So you literally make some time, car the processes carve out the time in your diary to write, do the writing, finish the draft. Let's just get it down to those steps. Um, and you will refine those processes over time. time to read what you have and as you read it um, you will have to go through a bit of a editing section there and um, you know see whether or not there's anything you can salvage um, we all change over time which is why writing that first draft in a specific period is a very good idea um, whereas uh, you know if you space it out over time you do forget stuff so if you're going to resume a project print everything off even if they're just one-liners and lots of notes um, read through and just scribble all over it and say okay so this I'm saving this character you know underline this and that and the other and and you will find bits you can use then go back to the story structure sort of idea, pull out your character, pull out what they want, and then get back to writing. So you can definitely resume a project, and I think it's a great idea. And then also, uh, Moesi says, what is the best advice to tackle the end of a novel? Why the last chapter seems so hard? Okay, well, I hope what I've been saying about that inciting incident and, and completing that arc, you know, they've set out to do something, and do they achieve it or not? And that is, well, the very, very last chapter is the denouement, the kind of return to the real world or the return to um, normal life or, you know, they go back home and they're changed. Dorothy returns back to Kansas or whatever and she's changed. And um, that second to last chapter, the penultimate chapter that is going to be your climax, which is the answer to the question in the inciting incident. time blocks for doing tasks like publishing or formatting which are quite technical tasks um, marketing um, all of these are tasks that I do in different time blocks um, so when I'm in first draft phase so I don't write first draft material every day I have times of the year when I'm ready and I will spend a concentrated period writing that first draft and then I'll move into the editing phase um, and then I'll move into the uh, publishing phase and that type of thing so it's just about time blocks and it's very important to schedule your creative time block um, when you are creative. So for me, that's in the morning, but for many people, it's often the middle of the night or like the lunch hour or, you know, whatever they can get. So um, definitely if you're, if you want to get the book done, don't get so worried about publishing or marketing, just get that first draft done. Um, and, or what I did with that first book is I would write before work. And then when I came home in the evening, I would do some of the marketing stuff when my brain was kind of more fried. Okay. So we're at, um, we are almost at, uh, the top of the hour. So <laughs> So I think we're going to stop now. But if you would like to send any questions about the course, please send it to support at thecreativepen.com. And uh, if you want to say anything to me, you can tweet me at the creative pen. Oh, here we go. It's all come through. Fantastic. Fantastic. Yes, got blog post ideas. Um, great session. Always useful. Thank you. And uh, the slides, remember, you can download the slides and I will send out an email with all of this um, with a recording and the slides tomorrow. So that is fantastic. So thank you all for being here. I really appreciated it. And uh, I hope some of you will come and join me in the Facebook group and on the course. And in the meantime, I will uh, say good night and wish you all happy novel writing over the next year. Okay, bye.